Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us today, uh, on Bobby and I, as we, we give a talk about street art and, and, and bring in some aspects of the exhibit that we're part of. Uh, if you're not familiar, my name is Jim Dacian. This is Bobby Ruiz uh, accompanying me, and we've prepared a short slideshow, but we really want this to be fairly casual. We know that there are folks viewing live, so we, we're thankful to several of the classrooms that are visiting, and as well as the people registered for the talk, but there also may be people who view this at a later date online. So uh, we'd ask you if, if you feel comfortable, go ahead and submit a question in, in the Q&A, and, and we can read that, and we can get to it during uh, the talk. I'll be able to read them out or, or reference them on purpose, or even direct them at Bobby. And if, you, uh, if you're viewing this later, make sure you write in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. So uh, thank you for coming. So we are, we are the co-curators of an exhibit called uh, Street Legacy at the California Center for the Arts. It ran during the summer of 2022 and is just about to close on August 1st. And many of the images that you're gonna see reference that show uh, but this is meant to be auxiliary and educational and hopefully provide you a better introduction to street art and, and, and what's happening with it. Um, Bobby, you want to say hi to everyone? Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm, uh, Bobby, <laughs> yeah, I'm Bobby Ruiz, co-founder of uh, Tribal Streetwear. Um, we're an international clothing brand. We have were established in 1989, and since that time, I've been working with um, street artists, tattooers, um, graffiti writers, graphic designers and and all of that so this is kind of a product of that network of the last 33 34 years absolutely and i had this slide prepared um one that had the street legacy uh graphic as well as the tribal graphic and a picture of bobby i i made sure to include a picture of bobby and not Gee, of myself when i thanks. put it together. yeah yeah, yeah. you're welcome so yeah. it, it, hopefully you get an idea <laughs> The, our working relationship here and, and how this goes. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with me, my name is Jim Dacian. I am a professor uh, and a dean, and I, I've written a lot about street art and graffiti over the years, as well as uh, a number of other academic topics. And these are just a few of the books uh, that I've covered during that time. And so it's always a great pleasure. I always feel like I'm an outsider looking in, and it's it's been great to work with Bobby because Bobby's very much part of the subculture. And, and in that way, I think we've made a good team because we tend to look at things a little bit differently, but at the same time, uh, come to an agreement on uh, the way we the way we think about it in terms of display, but also uh, how it needs to be celebrated and, and how it needs to further be looked at uh, academically, but also within culture overall. Um, I, I to, to talk really is focused on street art, even though the exhibit that we put together I think we would say it's about street culture in general. Bobby, what are the areas that we cover in the exhibit overall, just to give folks a, a larger context? We cover street art, graffiti, which there is a difference, um, tattooing and the tattoo tattoo art, uh, Chicano art, um, art from the lowrider culture, art from skate and surf culture with both uh, drawings, paintings, well, and photography. Um, so surf, skate, um, hip hop style graffiti, um, Chicano or gang style graffiti, and uh, just basically everything that was in our reach, we, we oh. pulled in. And it's all its street legacy. Exactly. And I think part of the thesis there is that all these various subcultures that come from street culture are embedded within tribal as a brand um, and and I think are represented. So street clothing and street style is also part of that. And it kind of, we use it as a way to think about bringing all these elements together. Today, we're, we're talking about street art, but we will talk about uh, some of the differences between graffiti and street art, because I don't think they're you can't talk about one without the other, and I'm hopeful that will be helpful for all of you. Uh, street art itself, I, I don't think it's any mystery that it has become just a worldwide phenomenon in terms of the exposure that it's had, museum exhibits, galleries, publication, blogs, I mean, sales of street art or street art, street work inspired by street art. Um, there's also a number of mural festivals around the world, and you can't go to a big city anymore without seeing some sort of 
emphasis on street art. And this is a, an image by David Flores, who's one of the artists in our exhibit. And I just prepared a few slides that show you work on the street compared to work inside the exhibit that we curated. So the following slide is also David Flores, but you can see there's a difference. Uh, it's hard to bring street art inside. It's street art inspired, right? Even if it's painted directly on a wall. Um, and we'll get to a few more examples. This next one is a uh, Another one you may recognize, Bobby, who's this? That's a great friend of mine. That's Risk, um, who is a graffiti writer from uh, Los Angeles. Um, I've known Risk since the early 90s. He's uh, established himself as what I would call probably the, probably the king of the East Coast style graffiti in, in Los Angeles as far as, I mean, the length he's been doing it. Um, and just his reputation from being from the West Coast and doing what began as more of an East Coast flavor graffiti on the West Coast. But he's he's doing big things. He shows all over the world and um, does a lot of work with canvas and neon and huge walls. He goes really, really big. And he's done a couple here in San Diego that are huge, but um, risky. Like if anybody that knows anything about, you know, graffiti, around the world risk is is one of those names that will will always pop up yeah absolutely and this is an example of the piece that you did for us obviously you can see it's a site the sidewalk all the details that would be on a city street but then mixing neon uh and it ends up being this three-dimensional sculpture or three-dimensional installation slash sculpture that probably blurs the line between uh what we would how we would Think about experiencing street art inside. So really fun, but at the same time, quite a bit different from what you might see out on the streets. Obviously, there's some practical reasons, but there's also chances to do things indoors um, that uh, you can use different materials and take some different risks when it's inside, but at the same time, celebrating street art. And, it, and if you know anything about street art, you've likely heard the name Shepard Ferry, maybe one of the, the biggest artist names in the world. And on the left is one of the stickers, on the right is a, a wheat paste mural in downtown Los Angeles. And when you walk into the exhibit, you see a piece by him. And what's kind of fun about this is you see these frame pieces on the left and you see wheat paste on the right. Um, integration or a combination of the materials you might find on the street, it even has that ripped aesthetic. But even within the frame pieces themselves, a lot of them are stencils, the, the type of materials that one would use to uh, create street art uh, out, out in the open. Anything else you'd say about Shepard, Bobby? Shepard um, is one of those guys that really put in, and, and a lot of people, yeah, they know his name and they're familiar with his work now, but one thing I can I can say about Shepard, because I've also known him since the, the early 90s, is Shepard put in a lot of work on the streets. Like Shepard would go higher and bigger than most graffiti writers or street artists, and he would go international. Um, he did a lot with stickers he had he definitely was one of these guys that promoted he'd give away thousands and thousands of stickers and people would get up for him as well so he he really did kind of have a, a a posse which was part of his his slogan in the beginning an amazing artist um he's uh you know i'd be in different parts of the world and see giant wheat paste on the top of buildings or you know, he, he was just up more than anybody. So he put in the work. Shepard, if there's anything to say about Shepard, he, he's the real deal. He, he genuinely put in the work and um, went big all over the world. Yeah, that's helpful. And that's so true. Uh, and so backing up a little bit, the term street art is interesting because it's not uh, a term that's been around very long. It originated in the 1980s. It was in the early 1980s. And there's a number of names we can associate it with. And we're not trying to pin it on one particular person here, but often uh, folks will reference Keith Haring, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Kenny Scharf as folks that were instrumental in bringing this new type of working outdoors. And so what was different from these folks compared to so many of the graffiti writers that existed for decades before these folks is that 
they brought an art school attitude and a lot of new materials to what they were doing rather than the traditional spray can or marker. I mean, is that does that sound fair to you, Bobby? It does. It does. And and it there was always some kind of um I would say in the in the 80s, 90s, and maybe even to the 2000s, there were a lot of rules that that applied more to graffiti that didn't apply to street art. Um, a lot of those rules have have gone away and changed, and there's more mixed media um, being used by graffiti writers. Where before it was mandatory that you use spray paint to really, or a marker, um, if you were just just out doing tags or or you know putting up your neighborhood or whatever. But I think um, these people were greatly influential in helping to blur that line and and make it okay to use different mediums to to do your your piece. Yeah, absolutely. And they opened up an incredible market in the galleries as well. The idea of collectibles. I mean, it just, the art world used to be so stuffy in itself and that it art had to be a certain thing. You know, it had to look like X. And when street artists start to come inside the galleries or take their work outside the galleries, it did really open up a lot of possibilities. And while maybe the world wasn't ready for it then, I think we're benefiting from it now as we, in, you know, in the 21st century. Now, uh, we've heard a lot of arguments in terms of where graffiti began, and we're not here to sort of set that record straight, and, and that's a topic for another day. But Oftentimes graffiti, the history of graffiti is broken up into two categories. There's this historical graffiti. When we look back at uh, the walls of ancient Pompeii or the Egyptians, and there were folks that were scratching their name, images, political slogans, uh, rude comments about you know their neighbors, and they're scratching them into the walls or they're writing them on the walls with various utensils. It fits the definition of what graffiti is, and what one could say even the cave paintings are a form of graffiti, depending how you reframe it. So graffiti is something humans have been doing ever since they could scratch or, or mark a surface on the wall, and even um, GIs during World War II. Uh, this is a, a, a famous symbol, Kilroy was here, that is attributed to soldiers all around the world. And whenever they would visit a certain place, they would write this, uh, this on the wall. And it would give the impression that, wow, Kilroy is everywhere, which isn't very far from some of the theories that we have about modern graffiti and uh, you know, having your name in as many places as possible. Other, if it, the, the second half of that, I, I think I would call rather historic graffiti, we'd call it modern graffiti. And this is when we're starting to use modern um, art materials like spray paint and our markers. And Taki 183 is infamous for doing this in New York, New York City, cornbread in Philadelphia. And on the West Coast, we have Chaz. And, and we know something a little bit about Chaz, don't we, Bobby? We do. We do. Chaz is also in the show. Um, Chaz, Chaz is a graffiti icon um, from from also from the West Coast and 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 from Los Angeles. I think um, if there's two people that hold that symbol, if there are you know Godfathers of the Western st California style, it would definitely be Chaz for more his Chicano neighborhood style graffiti and what he established, and then Risky for doing that that other style. But those are the two names that jump out from Southern California, but, you know, Chaz can tell you where he drew his inspiration was, was prior to him. A lot of his letter styles came from what was coming out of, you know, back from the 1940s um, from different parts of the, the country. Um, there was a lot of graffiti that was documented in, in Texas, different parts of Texas, soldiers, GIs, and, um, but Chaz is definitely an iconic figure that we're, we're real proud to have a large, beautiful piece in the show as well an amazing person and he also he's uh he's worked in the movie industries and he's travels all over the world and he still shows um all over the world just an amazing person yeah absolutely and and so there are other folks we may not associate with street art or graffiti that were doing work or putting guerrilla installations outside Example would be the Gorilla Girls. They were an anonymous group of female artists that were uh, communicating images about uh, women's rights or the amount of women um, who are in particular shows or in the art world or how they're represented. 
uh, they all took on um, names of dead female artists. So, and, and they wore gorilla masks when they put their work up. And so uh, this is a good example of East Coast. Uh, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? And you can see the gorilla mask. So it was meant to be funny, uh, but at the same time, um, uh, also kind of blurring, like, it, you know, going from that fine art, including uh, some of these definitions of street art that we're going to see. And someone just chatted, will we see Chaz's work that's in the museum? Yes, we have a slide of that in a little bit. Uh, another example, Ch Jenny Holzer, uh, contemporary artist, uh, she would write truisms. But again, this is wheat pasted, a lot like Shepard Fairey's work. So wheat paste it in the streets and, and it becomes a street intervention. So uh, that gives you a little bit of idea, some context of historical things, thinking about um, historical graffiti, but also modern graffiti. And, and then I gave you a few examples of street art there. And we're going to talk more in depth about that. But I wanted to show you a few more images from the show, just to give you an idea of what we're thinking about when we see street art and it looks different when it comes inside the gallery but there's often elements that you can that you can pinpoint uh anything you want to say about any of these artists bobby you know the first thing that jumps out at me when i, I look at these pieces is um just the evolution of the artists themselves when you look at you know persuade who's on the far right um a, just a straight graffiti kid from from southern california that's that's uh you know he's he's also become international and he's developed these characters over the years and you can see uh bunny kitty in there and then um the gorilla character i forgot his name but how how they evolved from you know just doing graffiti on the streets to international galleries and developing entire product lines um he i know he has books um plush toys um a whole line de that he developed around these different characters and the far left is also a great friend of mine gain who's also from from san diego and taking different mediums and and producing pieces like this this is um i think it's epoxy uh spray paint acrylics he used it's it, this piece is actually done i think there's three separate pieces that that make this one piece um, and then just watching it evolve into the style. Um, Tristan Eaton, the guy in the center, is probably one of the, the more noticeable names coming out of Los Angeles right now. He's, um, I think he's probably goes bigger than anybody in LA right now with, uh, wouldn't you agree? What do you think, Jim? No, I think you're right. I mean, he's very commercially sort of sellable too with his yeah. images. I mean, it blurs uh, street art, but it also looks, like uh, vintage advertising sometimes. And he did those, the, a huge mural um, at Universal Studios with multiple characters, mm -hmm. um, really involved in the NFT game. And he, um, besides that, he just did a big mural. I believe it's Hollywood and Vine or Hollywood and Highland, where he featured a very, very big mural where he featured a lot of Los Angeles legends, including another guy that's in our show, Esteban Oriol is part of Tristan's Eaton. And, and a lot of these guys, they have, uh, they work together. They have a lot of respect for each other. And, um, you know, they're, they're willing to like even feature them in their work. But this is, this was a fun wall to put together. Cause I think these three pieces just talk to each other nicely. Yeah. And we have a few more examples from the show and it's interesting. Well, uh, if once we talk about the differences between street art and graffiti, it's, it's interesting to look at some of these things. Again, street art tends to be much more image based where graffiti is letter based. Um, but someone asked about Chaz, this is the work by Chaz that's in the show and, and wheat on the left. Um, and obviously we've got a skull theme here overall, but anything you want to say about wheat? Wheat. Um, Wheat actually spends a lot of time in Southern California. He, 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 for years, he was here at least half the year and then he'd go back to his home. He lives in a town called Tours right outside of Paris, um, but very involved, not just with tribal um, as the brand, but in California culture, lifestyle and graffiti in general. He's worked with uh, some real high-end fashion brands, but just, you know, another one of those stories that just a kid that started doing graffiti that was able to make a living out of it. And um, it's taken them all over the world. Um, again, a great example of, of just the use of different materials, mixed media and 
and just kind of, you know, you look at what he did with his piece at Street Legacy or his pieces and busted up pieces of wood, different textures, colors, some of it's acrylic, some of it's spray paint marker. Um, it's a it's a beautiful piece. The Chaz piece on the right looks really small there, but it's a big piece. What is that? Like, how, what size do you think that piece is? Uh, I think it's it's got to be close to eight feet tall. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so a it's really taller, big piece. It's the, yeah, the, it's taller than me. The character um, that you see in the Chaz piece is known as Mr. Lucky. And it was a, a character that um, he developed that became iconic for the neighborhood that he's from, which is um, the avenues. So that kind of became the neighborhood or gang icon for, for that neighborhood. But another thing that's pretty cool about this piece is if you look at the, the background names um, is, is, you know, you could see a Stevan Orioles, you can see Oriole in there. Roger Gassman, which is also a, a great curator, um, friend of ours as well, and and just how they're, you know, they they give shout outs and pay tribute to people that they admire in their works. But um, yeah, just it's jazz. Yeah, and it's a central piece in the show. It's also nice. It mixes this wonderful lettering as well as the stencil technique. Um, and, and as you go further in street art, you'll see like all kinds of different media represented. And this is Slick and uh, Three Little Pigs. And he uses a little bit of uh, some spray paint. You have this adhesive backing that has image. And then of course, a more professional production uh, with the sculptural components of it as well, as well as some real donuts you can actually eat. Um, also being in San Diego, we have uh, thematic things about our ocean, Marissa Quinn on the left. Um, uh, who also comes from, who does muralist, but also trained as a tattooist. Um, Bobby, anything you want to say about either piece? Um, that's Espana on the, the right. She's um, Gain, the artist that we looked at his piece earlier. Um, that's his wife. Mm -hmm. And her, if the, this is kind of the whole piece is kind of buried in clear, um, I guess it's epoxy. It's epoxy. Yeah, it is. There's real and, trash and it, in it. It's it's yeah. There's and it's it's kind of um, just bringing attention to pollution in the in the oceans and just something that she put together. And it's a, it's also a bigger piece that um, that you can see in the museum. But um, these are both. You know, we live here in Southern California. A lot of what we do evolves around the beach and you know beach culture and activities that we do at the beach. And this is just kind of. A look into that world by these two two artists. Yeah, what I like about both uh, women are is their uh, techniques really sound, really detailed. And as we look across all these artists, I mean, there's not really an easy way to pinpoint why someone we call a street artist. Often it blurs with so many of these other categories that it becomes really really tough. Um, lastly, um, we, have, we have two folks here that combined for a piece. Bobby, you want to talk about this one? Um, this is, uh, there's some, one thing I can, I guess I'd like to say about this show in general and the, the group of artists that we work with is beyond their art and what they're showing in the show, there's some amazing stories here. Um, the artists, their background, what they've experienced in their lives and where they're at now so great stories of accomplishments of of people that have um made some mistakes maybe in their lives and were able to 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 move on and, and develop themselves um not only from a business standpoint but you know artistically um this is also a huge piece i think this is about eight feet tall yes it um, is. and it's and um yeah it's probably like seven by eight but yelly is is uh works with big sleeps and big sleeps is on the right um and she she works uh, in the studio with him and she's an an amazing tattoo artist from i'm not sure what neighborhood she's from but she's from from los angeles big sleeps um that's one of those stories that, that i'm talking about i've known sleeps for probably about 20 years um he spent a lot of time incarcerated he he's been shot multiple times and just has a has a gang history but now he um he's one of the bigger names in coming out of LA the LA graffiti scene as a tattooer as a muralist he does shows all over the world um he's established a 
you know, he does a lot of merch and clothing and sells paintings and um, very respected. Uh, he's worked with the Getty. He does um, lectures and programs through the Getty Museum. He's um, he's just a, a great person and he does a lot of work um, with kids in the neighborhoods that that he, you know, ran when he was a kid going back and teaching kids about art and about just trying to do the right thing so he's definitely giving back to the community and it's an honor to have him and Yelly both in the show um but you know like I said earlier some of these shows are amazing I mean the the stories sleeps and you know cartoon Mr. Cartoon has an uh, amazing story as well and you know even like we were saying earlier people like Shepard and and risk and just every artist has has a story and you know if you get a chance to dig in a little deeper with some of these artists and seeing what they've encountered in their lives and and what it took to to be in the position they're in now it's um there's some real inspiration there yeah and i think i mean there's over there's almost 100 artists in this show and we can't highlight every single one and while some have gained uh, particular state, some pretty big stages in which to put their artwork upon. Uh, many others have not, uh, but we feel like this show is um, it, it's providing art that I think is more relevant in many ways to the everyday person. And I think that's been uh, proven with how folks are coming in and responding to the work. It's work they're excited about, their stories they're excited about, it's culture they're excited about. Uh, and so the next few slides, I'm going to basically give the quickest version of modern art history that you've ever heard. So I'm going to apologize to every art history professor out there that's listening, but it's going to place street art within a particular context that I think is helpful to understand. So if you bear with me for four slides, I'll make it super quick. Uh, so when we think of art, art was invented, or the term art was invented in the Renaissance. This is a Western perspective. And so prior to that, art was a, was a craft. It was something that you can learn. It was during the Renaissance that art with a capital A, that this was some sort of gift that only certain people were able to practice. And it was all about doing it as realistically as possible. So you think of things like the David by Michelangelo or the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. For hundreds of years from the Renaissance into the 19th century across the world. I mean, and this is a Western thing. So it's not necessarily, there are many different cultural takes on it, but there were schools established called academies that basically were there to teach these realistic lessons of making art. And that was just painting and sculpture. That was art. There was no such other thing. All the other different types of lens-based art or camera or film or performance, that didn't exist yet until the modern era. So it was just painting, sculpture, and it was about doing it as realistically as possible. And they studied in places like this. When the modern era came, and you think of Impressionism, it they were about breaking each of these rules that the academy had set up. So the impressionists like Monet, instead of making an image as realistic as possible, were trying to break it down into little short brushstrokes to give an impression of a scene. You keep moving further in art history and we use additional concepts to break down that tradition that academic art had started. So Van Gogh, for example, uh, we call him a post-impressionist, but what he was doing was he was embedding emotion within those short choppy strokes. And then you get something that actually gets a little bit of the heart of the artist coming across on the, cam on the canvas. So again, we're a little bit further away from the academic art. Move to things like abstraction and Picasso, where we look at real objects and then we abstract them in our mind and we create symbols for those things. Again, moving further and further from realism, and eventually you get to the point where now, uh, in in the mid uh, 20th century, artists just started painting their ideas that were in their head or in their heart and getting them out on canvas. And so this is an example of Jackson Pollock where it was totally abstract and the subject matter wasn't even something that you could look at, the subject matter was within. So a lot of folks felt like as the progression of modern art happened, it moved things further and further from our everyday observable life. Uh, and, and in some cases, folks felt it wasn't as relevant anymore. The last image I'm gonna show is by 
Andy Warhol. It was uh, an image produced in the 60s and it was a Brillo box. It looked just like the box you would find in a grocery store. Um, it was screen printed, this was wood. Uh, the problem is you never knew it was art unless it was in a gallery or if it was on a pedestal. If Andy Warhol's sculpture was in a supermarket or on a street sidewalk somewhere, you couldn't tell it was art. And so this became a problem uh, with the development of modern art that you had to have some kind of specialized knowledge to know what art was, or you needed the context of the gallery to tell you what art was. So the history of modern art in many ways, and Gauguin said this was the progressive loss of art's audience. My argument, and I think Bobby would agree with me, is street art, graffiti, you know it's art the moment you see it. And it's one of the reasons it's so popular and it's so relevant is that you can walk down the street, you see it, and you take a picture of it and you experience it and you know it's art. You don't need the museum or the gallery to tell you it's art. You certainly don't need a pedestal. It's something that we innately recognize as something special and something creative. Does that make sense to you, Bobby? It sure does. Um... Go ahead. I mean, I was, I had a conversation the other night um, that, you know, if it's, it's street art is seen more, I think, in other parts of the world than it, well, there's, there's, it's definitely more, Europe it has, I think, more street art than, than what you see in the U.S. Um, from what I've seen, you do see a lot of, I think, more graffiti in Southern California, I guess, but, it, you know, you see a lot in different parts of of Los Angeles and San Diego, but if you go to cities like Barcelona, um, Paris, London, um, so much more street art um, done with you know stencils and wheat paste and combination of of different things, and there is a good amount of of graffiti there as well. But um, you're right, like it's it's as you when you see it, you know that it's art, that it's a statement, that it's somebody either trying to make a name for themselves or just expressing themselves. I think it's uh, you know, you know, you know, it's art, um, and that's always been kind of you know, in the '70s, '80s, and into the '90s, you know, people trying to say that graffiti wasn't art at all, that it was just um, graffiti, mm -hmm. but now all of that has changed where you're seeing i think some of the most contemporary of modern art if you will are is done by graffiti writers um damien hurst or you know people like risk or or even you know guys that are doing calligraphy style stuff like like retina or or you know there's so many amazing artists shepherd fairy banksy things like that 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 have emerged from the streets that are now considered some of the most, or even, you know, look at what Basquiat is, is, has turned into. Um, all of these artists just were elements of, of the street culture. And now it's undeniable that it is, you know, art and it's become one of the most desirable types of, of art out there right now. And, and also getting back to the show, just, judging from the amount of attention and attendance that, that the show has has received that there is a very real audience for this art that people you know are interested in it and and i think it'll continue to grow and you know just um become greater than it is now yeah absolutely and and one of the terms uh, I, I put it down here is sometimes folks will say post museum of art post museum art and that that's you know it's art outside that context but the auction um the auction world has called it urban art you know art and i, I that the idea is that it's inspired by the street altogether uh, but it's definitely something that you can, it's it's a trend that's not going away. I, I think it's a movement and, and one of the biggest uh, that we've had in a long time. And there's a number of st street art and graffiti museums around the world too uh, that are there to celebrate and help educate and facilitate uh, more work. Now, so Bobby and I have used graffiti and street art interchangeably a bit, and we've said that they're different. And, and this comes from a, a text that I wrote uh, many years ago, and it's a Venn diagram that helps to make sense of it. And this isn't me coming up with this. This came from a number of interviews with folks that would identify from various backgrounds as, as street artists and graffiti artists. But the idea is that uh, graffiti and street art are related. And one way to break it down, and granted, this is an academic mind talking about it, not necessarily someone who's working within the culture. So 
uh, so there may be some disagreements here, but uh, there's three categories of graffiti writing. And so a way to think about it, graffiti writing, artistic graffiti writing and artistic graffiti. You can see there's overlap with the Venn diagram because there's gonna be characteristics that they share, but then there are some characteristics that are noticeably different. I think images will help as we, as we look at them, but graffiti writing essentially is sometimes called mere graffiti is just writing letters, that's it. It's probably the most common type of writing that you would see. One could call it tagging, you could do it with a marker, you could do it with spray paint, but it's limited to those, those materials. Um, when you bring other types of materials into it, it becomes something else. So that's just graffiti writing. Artistic graffiti writing, I have an example from the show, and that's Mike Giant, is when the elements of principles of design are brought into the writing of the letters. And this is where you see some of these more complicated writing styles like wild style or some of the more traditional West Coast writing styles. But it's, it's definitely taking into account the flow, the rhythm, again, all the elements and principles design that one would one would put into putting together a really good composition. Uh, and, and you might even call it a piece or a masterpiece when you, when you see something that's really well done. So you can see the difference between two styles. Does that make sense to you, Bobby? And I'll move to the next one. Artistic graffiti is the difference here when we lose the letters and images become more predominant in its creating. So this is, a, this is a mural by Kenny Scharf. This was actually on the backside of the museum. It was done in conjunction with, with the exhibit. And uh, there was a bunch of orange groves uh, at one point uh, next to the museum and, and Kenny was inspired by that. But Kenny's one of those folks that goes back to the 1980s. We mentioned him before. Uh, again, we probably put him in the street art category, but I could call this artistic graffiti because He's using images prim primarily, but he's still using spray paint. And that's all he's using altogether. Street art is technically when you bring all the other types of materials that you might find in art making, anything you might find at Home Depot to oil paints, to yarn, uh, and then bringing it to bear by putting something outside. Uh, so uh, we have examples of that with things that maybe are produced in a factory, but we put them out on the street, something uh, of yarn material, a stencil, and of course, wheat paste is probably one of the more well-known versions of that. So uh, those, hopefully that makes sense as you think about each of those categories and how we separate those, those street art from graffiti. Anything you would add to that, Bobby? Um, no, I think you, you nailed it. Um, that, that cryptic piece is just, that's, that's kind of, um, taking a look at at just inspiration from around the world and how these street artists are grabbing inspiration from everything from um, Arabic calligraphy, Japanese um, letters, uh, Chicano writing, like, you know, gang style writing, um, East and West Coast graffiti and developing their own styles. And then cryptic, what he did there, the piece on the far right, right is took it to another level and cut it out um, beveled it, painted it, and it kind of floats off the wall. Just an amazing piece, but just kind of um, this, just the amount of thought, the thought process, and the amount of work that that these guys are putting into a single piece and using different materials to to get their, you know, their art to to where they want it to be. And so I'll. Um flip through some images very quickly, and these aren't meant to highlight um, any of the particular artists, but just giving an example of how street art can be so different depending on location and the various styles. Uh, there was a question in the chat about, uh, can we talk about how street art has helped tell stories that don't get told? And what's great about street art is, is that there isn't someone there to monitor the content that is often put out on the street. If it's truly street art, it's put out there, um, it, it's not curated. And so I, I love this piece because this who needs a gallery when I can paint here for free? It's a way of taking your art directly to the people who would see it. Uh, without a, a gallery director or museum director to edit or censor what the, the artist may have. And so there are really big examples of that. And there's, uh, you know, places like Miami that 
have uh, lots and lots of walls and, and it smiled upon creating work that, that's this big. Obviously there's examples of it where it is curated and it is facilitated and then it becomes more mural-like than street art-like. Uh, but nonetheless, there, there are some there are overlap there but between all of them. Um, this slide is actually cryptic. The, the artist that Bobby mentioned, this is, a, this is a, an apartment building in Long Beach that all of a sudden looks very regal with uh, his images on, on the outside. And a few more images. Uh, one of the criticisms of street art is because it is so um, popular, and it has become accepted within the general lexicon and uh, advertisers have caught on to that. And you'll often see advertisers and street artists working together uh, to create murals in particular cities that sometimes are advertising a product. I mean, that's no longer street art, it is an advertisement, but this is somebody's take or um, critique of one of Shepard Ferry's uh, uh, pieces in Boston many, many years ago, as though it's just out there for money. But there are examples of street artists doing things that have some larger, uh, larger goals about the environment or mistreatment of uh, various folks. And so this is Banksy's work. Uh, this was part of a, a larger installation that he did in England. But it was uh, it was a take on theme parks, and it was. Uh, uh, making fun of them, uh, but at the same time, and critiquing probably uh, the how the mistreatment of animals in SeaWorld was uh, obviously one of those folks, as you can see this this really lovely creature coming out of the toilet and jumping into a, a pool that's way too small for, for him. Uh, and the last image I was going to show you of Banksy is, this is the Waldorf Hotel. And it's an image in Bethlehem. It's a hotel that looks directly at the, the wall that separates Palestine from Israel. It's a, a very hotly contested part of the world. Uh, it is an actual functioning hotel, but it's also an art installation uh, that um, is, is, is about supporting Palestinians. And so even inside, he has a gallery that, again, fits a similar theme, supporting artists in that area. So there's a lot of good stories about how street art can change the world. Uh, it can do it on a local level. It can do it on an international level. Uh, and I think what Bobby and I both love about this particular show and the artists that we highlighted is, you know, these objects and these, these images, they communicate and they make sense to all of us. Uh, and there's a reason it's one of the most popular genres of art making in the world. That idea of that it's post-museum art, that you don't have to go to a gallery to see it is a big deal. And it challenges so many of the traditional notions of how we engage art and questions assumptions that we have about the arts in general. Um, Bobby, who's this piece by? That's uh, Carly and Konecki. It's a, it's a, it's a couple um, from here in San Diego who are they're probably the most visible out of any muralists or um, street artists, graffiti couples or whatever you want to call them. And here in San Diego, they're up real big downtown all over the county. I know they just did a piece at the new stadium in the valley. Um, it's they're they're just uh, they're real big here in San Diego. Great people. And, and again, it's it's an honor to have them in the in the show. Absolutely. And so I think what we'd want to leave you all with today is that we just want you to look closer at your environment. And there's so much out there. Uh, and even like in the stadium, the Snapdragon Stadium that Bobby mentioned, there's so many of uh, the artists within our show. I know Shannon Fulton also did a mural there. Uh, but it, um, it's, it's a pretty amazing place. And San Diego, Los Angeles, and so many other cities and towns around America have uh, great opportunities to look at street art and graffiti um anything you want to say to close us out me yeah <laughs> um come see the show if you haven't seen it um you've got till october 2nd um it's at california center for the arts in escondido it's uh it's a very unique show um it it like i said it took us both jim and i a, a quite a long time to to assemble it and make the decisions on who would be in the show um basically we ran out of room because we we would have liked to have kept going but um some amazing amazing pieces there so give yourself some time if you haven't seen the show um like i said till october 2nd um if you haven't seen it definitely check it out and um 
if you're not able to go see it or um, it's not in your area, there will be some documentation coming about the show and, and you know, uh, we're working on a documentary. Um, a friend of ours, Hunter, is working on a documentary. Um, there's also going to be stuff that's going to go online. Um, look into the artists and read graffiti when you can, because it can tell you a lot about your environment, what's going on, not just in the streets, but politically and, and where people's heads are at. Yeah, well, thanks, Bobby. Always a pleasure to work with you. You make it all very easy and fun. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Appreciate everyone at the California Center for the Arts for uh, being behind this exhibit and helping us to make it a reality. And thanks to everyone who came. Uh, it was a, a really wonderful time and uh, we hope to engage many of you in future projects along the way. So stay in touch and thanks for listening today. We appreciate it.